Okay. Okay, um, we are starting today, Revelation chapter four. And just as a quick review, we, in Revelation chapter one, we began with, uh, John had a vision. Uh, the vision was of the son of man, of Christ, as he has the seven stars in his hand. He walks among the seven lampstands and, and you see him in his glory with all authority. And then from that vision, he moves to chapters two and three, where he speaks to the things that are happening right now as he speaks to the seven churches and he gives them each a message uh, of to stand firm, to resist um, the false teachers, to repent, to whatever they need at that moment. And we went through those seven churches. Now we move to the second next section of Revelation where it now we begin to see says he's going to begin to speak to those things which must soon take place. So now he's looking toward the future of what is coming, and we have another vision that's going to take a couple chapters to unfold for us before he gets into sort of the details of what is to come. But we always, it seems this pattern, he begins with a vision and then sort of applications of it. Um, so this is now the, the next vision in, in Revelation chapter four, and let's read through the whole chapter first. And then we'll break it down piece by piece. So, so Rob, uh, Rob Roy, if you would read for us uh, verses one to six, that first paragraph there for us, that'd be great. Okay. After this, I looked and behold, a door, sta a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which, had, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he, and he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. Great. Great. All right, the next paragraph uh, from um, the end of six to eight. Um, Pam, if you would read that for us. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature, like a lion. The second living creature, like an ox. The third living creature, with the face of a man. And the fourth living creature, like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings. And ox. Uh, are all full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Okay. And John, if you would finish up the section, verses 9 to 11. And wherever the living creatures gave glory and honor and thanks to him, who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders fall down before him, who is seated on the throne and worship him, who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will, they existed and were created. Great. Thank you. All right. I think we have a, a newcomer here. Is this Raymond? Yes, it is. Hey, welcome. Glad you could join us. So I'm going to stop sharing for just a minute so you can see everybody here. So um, everyone see, this is uh, Raymond is Whit Whitley, right? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. Good to see you. Glad you can join us. Thank you. Um, I think everyone's name, if you go over the screen, you can see everybody's name. 
Um, and they'll, I'm going to rename you so everyone can see that too. All right, so we're in Revelation chapter 4 today, um, and I'll be doing most of it on the screen here for you so you can see it. Okay. All right, back to our text. So in our text in Revelation chapter 4 with this vision, he looks up and he sees a throne and one seated on a throne. And in that picture, if you remember there around the throne, there are uh, 24 elders. And then there are the seven torches of fire. And then there are these four living creatures. And the four living creatures are saying, holy, holy, holy. And then the 24 elders bow down and worship him. So the first thing you have to ask is, does this scene, did this ring a bell to you? Did this scene remind you of anything that you've read before in the Bible? Claudette, you look like you know. Um, Ezekiel. Yeah. Ezekiel. What, was, what part of it reminds you of Ezekiel? The, uh, the creatures that had the, the four living creatures that had the eyes in front and behind. And they had the face of the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle. Yeah. And that they had the six wings, and they were saying, holy, holy, holy. Yeah, the, those living creatures, if you know, that, that does remind us of uh, Ezekiel chapter one. There's uh, Ezekiel's vision of these four, uh, four creatures that are uh, uh, described in that way. Uh, what's another passage that this re should remind you of? Particularly that holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Yeah, Isaiah, 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 Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6. That's the other, it's Isaiah's vision. So Isaiah and Ezekiel have had visions very similar to what John is seeing here. And when we read this, we're going to keep those in mind as we go through them. We're going to read about them. Now, before we go through this, I want you to notice there's been several numbers thrown at us in this passage here. Um, what are the numbers that we're presented with today? So we go through our passage, we scan through it here. Um, what do we got? Seven. We got seven. That's right. Seven torches of fire. There's a good 24. Number. 24. There's an interesting number. We're going to talk about that one today. And... That's a few other, actually one, at least one more, actually a couple more. Four. Four. Four living right. creatures, yeah. Four living creatures, yeah. And... Six wings. Uh, the six wings. Six yep. wings. Yep. Uh, I think those are the ones, right? So we got four, six, seven, 24. Now, remember when we went through Revelation before, I had sent you on the notes there, uh, a little reminder of numbers in Revelation. And how they are um, often they're used representatively. They're not, this isn't a historic account. It's a symbolic picture of what is to take place. And the numbers carry with them uh, significance. So when we look at this list here, if you remember, what's the significance of, let's start with the smallest number here, the number four? What is that representative of? The entire world, the four corners of the earth. Exactly right. That's the, the four corners of the earth, the, the entire world, uh, the north, south, east, west, the four points of a compass, the four corners of the earth. And so when you see things coming in fours, it's typically representative of all of creation overseeing it. There's a universalness of it. Uh, so all of creation, creation is considered in this. Um, the number um, six, this is going to be the six wings, which is going to go along with Isaiah's vision which we're going to find uh, in that where the it's more practical. You remember in Isaiah's vision what the six wings were about? Why they had six wings? Do you remember that? Two to hide their face, two to hide their feet, two to fly. Yeah, so that that number is is more of a is kind of practical about two covering the feet, two to fly, and two to cover the face. Um, so it, it six there is not used quite the same way it will be used in other places. But seven, what was the number seven about? Completion. It, it is completion, but more than that, much more the than The Lord's that. number. That's the Lord's number. That's the finished and complete work of God. It is, a, it is God's number seven. This is holy. And so when it talks about the seven spirits, what is that a reference to? 
Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. It's not seven different spirits. It's one spirit, but it's it's the Lord's, the Holy Spirit, because it comes in this number seven. And we were told that before about that. All right. The gifts. The tricky one is the 24, um, what that is about. And we're going to talk about that in a second. But you'll notice something about 24. What is 24 a multiple of? Two twelves. It is 12. And what is 12? Nations. Uh, not the nations. Oh, the tribes. 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 Twelve tribes. tribes, tribes, right? tribes. tribes. Right. So 12 is going to be the number of God's people. Uh, whether it's the tribes, the apostles, so that this has something to do with God's people, whereas the four will be regard to all living creatures, and the seven will be that which is um, uh, holy and sacred to God. So, all right, let's 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 go through this again, and just kind of break it down piece by piece here. He says, he looks up, and behold, he sees a door standing open in heaven. We've heard that phrase before, a door standing open in heaven. Um, we're in, in Revelation. He's referenced it a couple times already. Do you remember where, they, where it was? Revelation. Uh, last week. One, right? Yeah. We we did it last week actually, and yeah. uh, the the a couple weeks before that. So the first time, its reference is, is Revelation three eight, and um, let's read that real quick here. Um, what do we leave off here? Uh, Claudette, would you get uh, verse 8 for us of Revelation chapter 3? Just 8. Um, actually, read 7 and 8. How about that? And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write the words of the Holy One, the true one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. And I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. So here he writes to Philadelphia, if you remember, when he says, I have set before you an open door. What did that mean to them, that the Lord has opened a door for them? Man, heaven in heaven yeah he says i'm opening a door and no one can shut it an what opportunity is an opportunity for mean? you say it again bob it's an opportunity opportunity yeah we talk about that open doors like god would open a door for us um so if you come to someone's house and they open the door to you what does that mean welcome they're welcome, welcome. Yeah. They're welcoming you in if they close the door on you, what does that mean? Go Stay away. Out. Yeah, it's saying, <laughs> go away. It's pretty simple. And he says the same thing in, in uh, Revelation 3.20. He then reverses it and says, I stand at the door and knock. In other words, um, this door is closed between us. He invites them to open the door and welcome him in and eat with him and he with me. And so there's this, when he's, when John looks and sees this open door in heaven, what does that mean to John? And you'll notice the exclamation point at the end of that. And behold, a door standing open in heaven. What does John, what does that mean for John? He can go in. Yeah. <laughs> heaven is open. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a sign of welcome. It's, it's similar to the sign of when he says of Jesus, he sees the son of man with his feet face uh bright shining as the sun right that shining face of christ upon you may the lord make his face shine upon you that that welcoming um that he is welcome to come and, and then he hears the voice come up here and i will show you what is to take place um so that's the first part so this voice is speaking and like a trumpet what's the what's the purpose of a trumpet that we're going to find out here and throughout the bible what's why, why a trumpet? What's the trumpet doing? Loudness. No. It is loud, right? Mm -hmm. And it's it's used for when is trumpets? When are trumpets typically used? To get to announcements. To announce something, right? Um, sometimes it's announcing, getting ready for calling us to battle, or just 
saying the king is here, but it's, a, it's for announcements and calling out, declaring something. So you can feel the anticipation. The door is open now and the trumpet sounds here and he's called to come on up here. I'm gonna show you what is about, what must take place after this. So that's where we begin. Now, he says at this point, which we've covered before, he uses the phrase, at once I was in the spirit. Um, if you remember that phrase back in yes. Revelation 110? Yeah. We talked a little bit about that. Do you remember what we had said about that, what it means that he was in the spirit? Transcended. There's a transcendence, yeah, yeah. It's uh, not in the realm of natural. Yeah, yeah, he's seeing things that are not physically there. So when Ezekiel is in the spirit in Ezekiel 37, that's when he has the vision of the dry bones in the valley. And that whole scene comes to life for him. You can't go with an archaeological dig and find those bones that turned into a, a marching army. It's a, it's a vision that he's given, and he's seeing with spiritual eyes what is happening here. So what he's seeing here, it's not like as he's going through this experience, it's not like the people in the next cell over have any idea what's going on. They're not hearing sounds or voices. They're not seeing anything. He's been brought up and, and allowed to see things in this realm here that are true. And also with the spirit, it carries with it this authority. If you remember what it says about, Peter says about the scriptures, um, he says that the scriptures, how, how did the scriptures come to us? Uh, it was men, do you remember? Moved by the Holy uh, Spirit. Right. Yeah, car carried along by the Holy Spirit. So there's, he's, is not it's more than just claiming like he's a he's having a transcendental out of body experience it's also carrying with that he's in the spirit so he is this is the word of god this is a vision a dream that is the word of god to us that we take with that kind of authority and what does he see what's the very first thing he sees a throne a throne he sees a throne in heaven okay I need to ask you a quick question. Yeah. You notice the word stood here? Yes. And you notice back in verse one, the word standing? Yeah. What does that mean? Good question. Um, is that fixed or is it um, something that means security? Um, maybe I'm off here, but. No, I think. I'd like to um, I'd like to give you an answer that's well informed right now. I don't have one. I'd have to look at the at the Greek word that they're using there and how that's framed. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I have a note on it in my. I mean, it's a it, it's a adjective kind of. It's a yeah. enforcement of what is there. Yeah. So I'm not sure if it's. If it seems to me. Like, I, I'm going to guess, and again, I'm just guessing right now, so I, if I'm wrong, I, I might be wrong on this, but my, the impression I'm getting, at least from the translation of it, is this emphasis of something that is, is sort of firmly set, sort of right, solid, yeah, right, standing, you know, like that kind of a thing. Um, and so like what, when Paul says, you know, after you've done everything to stand, stand firm, kind right. of thing. so that kind of standing Perhaps that's what's in mind there, that it's firmly open. It's not a, it's not a door that's about to close. It's not a throne that's about to be moved. Um, I have the approved solution here, Pastor. Oh, excellent. Here we go. <laughs> it's the, the Reformation Study Bible. It says, God's kingly rule is a fundamental theme of the book. So this idea that it stands, that, that it's fixed to the ground. That All right. Yes. Got it. Okay. Firm foundation. Excellent. Pastor, I have you a stuck thought. the landing on that one. Very good. Thank you, Bob. Pastor, um, I have a thought about what we're, we're thinking about. It just came to mind, but I don't have the details in my head. Where was that where that battle was going to take place and they were afraid because there were so many people surrounding them? And then, he, then the Lord opened his spiritual eyes. Yeah. A whole host of heaven. 
Of, that's that's the story of Elisha. I think it's in Second Kings. Yeah, um, where he has his servant see open his eyes and he sees the armies of God in the yeah yeah. That yeah. Is devastating. <laughs> so he sees the throne standing in heaven, and then he says, "What does he see along with the throne stood in heaven?" He sees one seated. One seated on the throne. Now that's very significant. When you see a throne and one seated on the throne, what does that mean? Who is the first? Who is the one seated on the throne? When he's usually the king. He's the king, right? <clears throat> and when he's seated on the throne, what does that mean? He's in charge. <laughs> he is in charge. Yeah. All authority. All authority. He has authority. Now he had authority before he sat on the throne. But when he sits on the throne, that's when he begins to work. People have to understand that. It's like a judge. The trial doesn't begin until the judge takes his seat. And then the work begins. Every other job, most other jobs you have are done standing and so forth. And then when the person's finished the job, he sits down, right? But when you're the king, it's when you sit down that you begin to work. That's when you issue your orders. That's when you make your judgments. So when he sees God, the, the one seated on the throne, he is seeing a judgment scene where God is about to act and declare judgments to try cases, to bring forth witnesses, and then to issue his verdicts and to exercise those verdicts. That's what this is. Uh, it's not just he's it's not it's not just God, he sees God, you know, and God's in charge, but he's about to act now too. That vision. And so same thing with Isaiah when he sees God seated on the throne. It's a fearful scene, not just because he sees God, but because he sees God seated, ready to work, ready to issue his verdict, which he will in Isaiah's case. Um in fact, let's go back to Isaiah's scene here so you can see the similarities of that. Isaiah 6, um, and we'll look at, um, Paul, would you read that for us here? Are you there? Um, can you Paul? hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Would you read Isaiah 6? Can you see it okay? Yeah, in the year that King uh, Uzziah. Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and left lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple above him stood the seraphim each had six wings with two he covered his face and two he covered his feet and with two he flew and one called another and said holy 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 is the lord of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory. Should I continue? Yeah, down to verse uh, seven. Yeah. Okay. And the foundation of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphims flew to me, having his hands, hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched my lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. So you can see in Isaiah's vision here, he sees the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And look at the scene. It's, it's a terrifying scene for him. This is a judgment scene. As these, the seraphim are there who are the guardians of the throne, we're going to see them in, in, uh, in Ezekiel's vision as well, which is also a judgment scene. And they're crying, holy, 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 announcing him. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, right? And the house is filled with smoke. 
It's so terrifying that Isaiah cries out, woe is me, I am lost. And then you remember that song, uh, uh, here am I, send me, you remember that song? Yeah. Um, and it's a, I, I know that in the Catholic church, they sing that quite a bit. Wow. Um, and, uh, and it's a great song. And, but here it's like, you know, and, and this, usually we end it here. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And then I said, here I am, send me, right? And we, we cut it off there. We never go further to actually talk about what his mission was. And that's sort of used as inspiration for us. The Lord says, whom shall I send? And we say, here we are, send us, right? And, uh, but we don't talk about what Isaiah's mission was because Isaiah's mission was to go and say to this people, keep on hearing, and, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but don't perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. And I said, how long, O Lord? And he said, until the cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is a desolate waste and the Lord removes people far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again, like a terebinth or an oak, whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. It's a terrifying passage, as mm -hmm. Isaiah's mission is to go and tell the people that judgment's coming, and keep being, keep being dull, keep being blind, keep being deaf. Uh, the Lord is going to lay waste the cities now. And it's exactly what happened in, in Isaiah's day. He did see the fall of Israel, and prophesied also the fall of Babel, of, of, of Judah. Uh, not ultimately, but it will come around, but it was a scene of judgment. You can see his fear. Woe to me. I am lost. I'm an unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. Mm -hmm. That's the terror of this scene here. And, and remember this scene because it's going, there's some very interesting comparisons with what we're about to read in Revelation 4 once again. We come back to it. Uh, you'll notice the similarities first, that there are, um, there is the Lord on the throne, and there are the four seraphim, or the four living creatures, saying, holy, holy, holy. But you'll notice what Isaiah uh, didn't see in his vision that John did. There's two things, let's go back to our past in Revelation 4, that John saw that Isaiah did not see. Did you catch it? Let's read that first paragraph one more time and try to catch what it was, the difference between the two. So what did we leave off here? Um, Elizabeth, would you read uh, verses chapter four, verses one to six, that first paragraph one more time for us? Sure. <clears throat> After this, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments, with golden crowns on their heads, from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and pearls of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was, there was as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. All right. What is it that John sees that Isaiah did not see? The 24. All right. One of the things he sees is these, there are 24 elders around the throne mm. on their own thrones. That's something John didn't, uh, Isaiah did I not didn't. see that. Okay. So we have that. What else did he not see that John saw? The rainbow. There's a rainbow there. Oh, that's interesting. And all the, all the flashes of lightning and all that stuff. Um, well, he actually, Isaiah did have something similar with the uh, trembling, the, the place is shaking and stuff like that. The light, there was, didn't mention flashes of lightning, but there was like the whole threshold shaking. So we'll, we'll throw that in there, but it's similar. 
Uh, one more thing that uh, John sees that Isaiah doesn't see. Seven torches. He doesn't see the seven torches of fire, which is the Holy Spirit, 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 God. right? And also, but he had was, the seven lampstands. There's no mention of the seven lampstands, is there? No, no. I, I mean, no. in uh, in um, Ezekiel. Um, in Isaiah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm mixing up with Ezekiel. Sorry. sorry. Yeah. That's all right. So there's one more thing at the end. He also sees a uh, a sea of glass. It's glass. Like crystal, right? It's such a it's a different experience for John than for Isaiah. You'll notice that John doesn't cry out, "Woe to me, I am undone," does he? He doesn't cry out as if he's about to be judged. Mm -hmm. um, whereas Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up, and he is ready to run away in terror. Um, John sees a door open in heaven and is brought up. And while he's there, he doesn't run away, uh, even though he sees the flash of lightning, the rumblings and the holiness. But there are these four signs here that this is something a little bit different. Um, first, he sees a rainbow. Uh, Jasper, carnelian, and emerald. Anyone know what those things are? Emeralds? These stones? Big, these are precious stones. Precious stones. Yeah. Breastplate. Uh, they are actually they are those are those are the stones on the priest's breastplate. Yes, mm -hmm. um, they're luminescent colors. They're they're beautiful and precious. They were they're often I think they're described in the new heavens and the new earth. Um, but there's this glorious appearance here. But he describes it, puts them together, and describes it as a rainbow. Rainbow. What's the meaning of the rainbow? God's covenant with noah god's covenant with noah and in god's covenant of noah what did the rainbow mean he would yeah. never destroy the earth with war yeah. yeah it was a sign of peace that god would not destroy the earth this way again uh he'll destroy it with fire but not with the water again he won't do that again the next judgment will be the final judgment there won't be any other times this is going to happen like that again and so the rainbow was this beautiful sign of peace after the storm. And you see that same thing at the end with the sea of glass, like crystal. When we talk about a sea of glass, what does that mean? See, when you say the sea was like glass, what does that mean? My, um, no storms. Exactly right. right. It's perfectly calm. For the, Jews, for the Jews, they had tremendous fear of the ocean. Yes, the, the ocean and the sea was terrifying. It was chaos. Uh, it was judgment. The waters are terrifying. But when it's a sea of glass, it's just, that's the only time in a sense when a sailor or even a non-sailor can look out and just be completely at ease on the water, mm. like the sea of glass. Even though you're out of your element, even though you don't live out there, it's so perfectly calm, um, like crystal. All right, so we have that. And then you have this thing of these 24 thrones and, and there are 24 elders around this throne. Um, let's talk about that for a second. What's the meaning of the 24? I, I was always under the impression that it was the 24, uh, the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles. Yeah, that's one theory on that. I, I think, and that's what I used to think too. And, but looking more into it, I think there's a better theory. And that is, there are 24 divisions of priests in the Old Testament. And uh, you see this in 1 Chronicles 24. We're not going to go there because it's just a bunch of names. But um, David breaks up the priests into 24 divisions. And so uh, each of those divisions would serve for one week, and they would do it twice a year. And so remember Zechariah? and elizabeth mm -hmm. they were chosen that was their division serving that week when he was chosen by lot to serve in the temple and that's when he has the vision and so they have these 24 priests because these 24 they are called elders and they are seated on thrones which reminds you of what what does that mean seated on thrones themselves the judging judge part of the, the judgment yeah, yeah, they're judges. These are princes. These are like kings. They're 
they're they're they're they're serving in the same way and they're clothed in white garments and with golden crowns on their heads um and they are also the 24 i would argue given their presence around the throne is like they represent the priesthood here and that flows along with what john said at the beginning about us this is a really important phrase in john chapter revelation one when john speaks about us and says of jesus where is it here um to him versus verse five to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood that's the hence of the white garments and made us a kingdom they're your thrones priests to his god and father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever and this priesthood so these 24 indeed really represent the church all of god's people who are a kingdom and priests before the throne of god um, serving him in that way and so just like the seven spirits are not seven literal spirits but it's symbolic of the holy spirit the 24 elders are not 24 specific people because we never we're never given their names mm. but they represent the church uh, around the throne serving as priests reigning with christ and we see that also where else do we see remember ephesians let's turn there real quick ephesians 2 mm -hmm. right it speaks about us in our dead in our sins and transgressions. Mm. Right. And where do we leave off here? Um, Diane, would you read this for us here? Um, there's a beautiful passage. We can read through the whole thing, I guess. Verses um, four down to um, seven. I think that's where we went. Yeah, four to seven. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Um, you can see here God being rich in mercy, we were dead in our sins and he makes us alive and he, by grace, he saves us. We're cleansed. We're washed in the blood of Christ. Uh, and then he goes further and he raises us up with Christ and seats us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. John has a vision of what that would look like or what that symbolically looks like of the 24 thrones of these priests and kings around the throne in white garments, cleansed, reigning with Christ. That's a powerful picture of, of our salvation in Revelation 4. In, in Revelation 5, 5, 8, Pastor, it tells a little bit more about the 20, the four beasts, the 24 elders. Yeah. They had on them harps and golden vials <laughs> full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. What, what passage is that? Why? Chapter five, verse eight. Pretty well. Chapter five, verse eight. Yeah. We're going to get to them later on. We're going to talk the same group there. Yeah. Yep. Didn't have to deal with them. Sorry yeah, we'll that. talk about that next week when we get there on the twenty-four elders and what they'll do next. This scene will continue into the next chapter. Um, but those. Um, so this is this is John's vision now of this. It's a judgment throne, and yet there is this scene of. It's not terrifying to John as it was to Isaiah. It's an open door. It's a sea of glass. It's the Holy Spirit present there. It's the 24, it's God's people on thrones uh, with golden crowns, clothed in white. Nothing to be afraid of, even as he comes with flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. Let's That's talk about Sounds like it's a different purpose between Isaiah and, and, and this book. Yeah. Isaiah would be just judgment to come. And this one here is great hope for, for people who are being persecuted. Yes, it's going to be, uh, it's a, it's, 
it's a twofold message. You're absolutely right. Of it's not revelation is not just the judgment that comes upon the world, but it's the salvation that comes to God's people. Pastor, I was just wondering in Isaiah, uh, he mentions uh, the Lord's throne filling the temple. So that had to be some kind of sight to, for him to see. And maybe that helped make him upset. Yeah, the robe filling the temple. Right, right. Uh, yeah, remember we talked about that long robe. Yeah, yeah and that, I mean, that's, he's the top if it's all yeah. the way down filling the temple. Yeah, what, what, remember what the significance of the long mm -hmm. robe was? His authority. It is, it is authority, and it's the length of the robe is is the is the is the sort of the length of his dominion of with every nation that he would conquer that would be his you would add a length to the robe and so the longer the king's robe the the more the greater his domain and here we have the lord presented with this robe that just fills the temple um so in this he does mention here flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder uh that that calls to mind another scene in the old testament yeah. And that, that would go along with the elders too, mentioning them as elders. You know what that scene is? Well, the giving, giving of the law on Mount Sinai? Yeah, that's the giving of the law in Exodus uh, 19. Um, let's go to that real quick. Exodus 19, 16 to 20. Let's see how we're doing here. Okay. All right, let's see. Um, Claudette, would you read that for us once again? 16 to 20. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him in the thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. Yeah. So here Moses alone goes to the top of the mountain. The people are not allowed to go up there. Just Moses alone. Later on, however, um, the elders, Moses will bring with him elders up to meet with the Lord. I think it's in Exodus uh, 24. Let me pull it up real quick. Where as the God, God descends with the thunder and the lightning and the rumbling and the smoke and establishes this covenant with the people through Moses, and then later on, he will confirm that covenant, and we're told that, uh, verse 9, that Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. They were under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness, and he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. This was not a judgment scene. For Moses and the elders. This was an establishment of the covenant that's just starting out. And it's a glorious scene, and God permits even the elders to come into his very presence, and they behold God and eat and drink in his presence. Um, so there is this kind of a mixture of scenes here where John is beholding the Lord on the throne, um, like Moses and the elders might have, and the rumblings and the peals of thunder and it, it's a it's not a terrifying scene in that regard that he's under wrath as isaiah was so let's uh let's pick up from where we left off here um the four living creatures i'm not sure if we're going to be able to get to them oh it's going to be a tough one here <laughs> okay we'll see what we can do with the four living creatures now what are these things here let's read that one more time uh julia would you read for us um, that second paragraph here, verse six and down to eight? And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes, 
in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Okay. So uh, John's vision now, he has the four living creatures, which Isaiah saw. And what did Isaiah call those four living creatures? Seraphim. They're called seraphim in Isaiah. Um, they're, I think in Ezekiel, you see them also. And what, what, are they, what are they there? What are they called? I'm not sure. You remember? The seraphim? Cherubim. Cherubim, cherubim right? So, so the ones in Ezekiel, I thought each creature had all four faces. Yeah, yeah. And this reads like each creature has one of the faces. Yep, yep. So, um, the, the point of it is not that they're seeing, um, I, you, you would have to say, look, they're seeing the same thing, um, but they choose to describe it in different ways. It's, it's not to be taken in a, a literal way. Um, it's, it's symbolic. This is very symbolic here. What these cherubim and seraphim look like we really can't say uh, the, the pictures presented to us uh, intend specific meaning for us to grasp that we're going to talk about in a second. Um, but it's not that we, if we go to heaven and we come across one of these creatures, we're going to see, you know, a four faced creature with lion, ox, you know, and, and man, it's, it's, it's a bizarre. Eyes imagery. All over. <laughs> yeah. And eyes all over. I mean, just, it, don't go in the desert. You got eyes all over. Like what a, what a disaster that would be. So you, so, but, but they mean something. Every one of those details means something of great significance. So we don't want to get, you know, it's, it's not, he's not giving us a literal description of what it's like. Uh, he really can't explain heavenly things to us. So he gives us symbols to, to kind of grasp a little further. So around the throne on each side of the throne, we have these four living creatures the seraphim, the cherubim. And do you remember what they were? They, th these are um, the cherubim and the seraphim, what their role is? Guardians of the throne. Yes, they're guardians of the throne. The seraphim and the cherubim, they are the guardians of God's throne. That's what we saw in Ezekiel. They are, when, when the Lord is present, that's what these are. They are the, the creatures on the on the Ark of the Covenant, you have the cherubim on top of the Ark, symbolic of that. All throughout the temple, you see that. As opposed to the angels, they are not angels. What's the difference between the angels and the cherubim? Angels are messengers, whereas uh, the cherubim are there specifically to God, the uh, throne. Yeah. So, so cherubim dwell around the throne of God. And that's their their purpose. That's their their gain there. So when you when you see cherubim, you are not on this planet anymore. You are in the heavenly realms. Angels are messengers who are spiritual beings from heaven, but they come to us into this earth as well. So any any spiritual being that would enter into our realm, we would call an angel. Even the Lord Himself is called an angel. He's the angel of the Lord even though he's God himself because he enters into our realm and takes, takes on human form. Uh, he becomes in a sense that, and, and the angel in that regard. So he sees these living creatures and they're described. He says this four of them, remember the number four of, of the universal of creation. And then the lion, the ox, what, what are the four again? The lion, ox, man, the ox, eagle, the man, and the eagle. eagle. And it's interesting, it's an eagle in flight. Okay. And just the face of the man? Um, 
each the third living creature with the face of a man. So the first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man. So maybe the body would have may have been like the others. And the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. It's hard to describe what these would be. Um, but yeah. what is the significance of lion, ox, man, eagle? Remember what that was? We talked about it when we were in uh, Ezekiel. Man, domestic animals, wild animals, and birds. <laughs> yeah, these are the four major groups of of creatures, at least on the on the, the land dwelling. We don't worry about the fish; they're in the in the waters and the chaos. We don't see them. We don't deal with those. But the man, obviously, who has dominion over all the earth, the lion is. He's what do we call the lion? The wild he's the king, right? He's the king of the beasts. He's the king of the wild animals, right? That's what is the ox then? If the lion is the king of the wild animals, what's the ox? The strongest of the of the uh, tamed animals. Yeah, he is the sort of the king of the domestic animals. Uh, those that have animals in their farms, the the ox is the monster on the uh, of the of the domesticated animals, and then of course the eagle. King of the birds. He's the king of the birds. I mean, eagle in flight high, flies high above them all and uh, is feared by them all. So you have these four uh, sort of representative kings representing all of creation. And all of them were um, um, sort of over their domains. And even the eagle in flight shows you that he is, it's, he is really master of his domain. You're not afraid of an eagle on the ground. It's the eagle in flight. That is his, he's in his domain at that point. So those are the four living creatures. And we saw with Isaiah, the six wings in the presence of God, covering two to cover their faces, two to cover their feet and, and, and two to fly. So they're sus being suspended. Um, but the eyes all around them, what is that about? Mm -hmm. All seen. All still. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing is hidden from their sight. They're ever watchful. Again, if they are the guardians of the throne, that would be sort of symbolic. Nothing is hidden from their sight. Even I think in some they describe them even under their wings, they are filled with eyes. I think in Ezekiel's vision, he describes that even under their wings are eyes. So there's nothing, there's no corner that is hidden from their sight. Um, Eagle. They're noted for their eyesight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it's a, and these are, so also that these four creatures are, um, they're fierce looking. I mean, they're, they're in, in their each domains, there's a fear. In fact, I think it's in, um, in Job, they talk about the wild ox, which is a fearful creature um, that, that you would come across, not, He's different from the lion, but he's a, a fierce creature of his own. So, in fact, you know, I have, a, I have to show you this. You know, I am, a, I am Assyrian, and the Assyrians, though they didn't believe in the Bible at the time, they did have something very interesting. I want to see. Can you see my my thing here? Uh, and I, I grew up with these things. The, the Assyrian bull. Mm -hmm. Look at that. Mm. A lot of images. Isn't that something? Yeah. Now, th this is not, they're not a uh, Christian. Here's a better one right there, if you can see that. Mm. So it had like the face of a man, had the wings of an eagle. Mm. The, I think it was like the body, I think it was a body of an ox. And I mm. think it was a tail of a lion. Is how they did it. Oh yeah, wow. so it captured those four realms as well. And these are the Assyrians. This is in 800 BC or so, uh, long before um, John has his vision, and even Isaiah and Ezekiel have their vision. So it's kind of interesting, huh? So. Yes. Oh, look at that. Yeah, That's different view. Man, so those, are, those Assyrians were fierce, Pastor. They were fierce. <laughs> yeah, they were very fierce. And it, it could be that John is, in, you know, and Ezekiel and Isaiah are sort of borrowing 
the the imagery to present convey that theme of fierceness of uh this is the the uh the heavenly realms and the the judgments and so forth that are to come they never stop saying um holy holy holy, holy, holy. almighty who was and is and is to come um and you would, you know, when, when we think literally like, oh my goodness, how horrible would it be to be a cherubim that you're just constantly droning on saying, holy, 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 right? Um, that's not the point of that. What, what are they saying? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. What are they declaring, first of all? That God is holy beyond your imagination. Yeah, what, what does that mean, though, Rob, when we say that God is holy? What, what does that mean? I think you can use your R.C. Sproul take on that. I think he's done great work on holiness. I think he's, he is otherly. He's other than us. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, sometimes people take that thought too far because there has to be a point of contact if he's going to be able to to communicate with us. So he is otherly, but not so otherly that he cannot communicate with us and relate to his creation. Yeah. It, it, he, he is, is other. You know, yeah. he is he is beyond our imagination, his holiness. Yeah. That's a good that's a good word, you know, otherly, that he is uh, of another um just of another domain of an of another kind. You know, we, we, everything we see in this world and ourselves included in it are creatures, you know, the living creatures that, that emphasizes that these glorious beings are creatures, right? Mm -hmm. There's only, there's, there's two categories, there's creature and what will be the other category that God is a part of? And, and if Heavenly? only take his yeah. sandals off because he was on holy ground. Yeah. So you're, you're. Him. Yeah, so you're dealing with, there are creatures, and these are glorious creatures, but they're creatures. You get to create. And then there's the creator, and he created all things. And the focus on God here is, with, with this incredible scene of elders and living creatures and so forth, that there is this one God Almighty who is holy, he's other, he is the first area in which he is completely different from us, is he is eternal, he was and is and is to come. Whereas every, everything else that we know and see had a beginning. Right. Everything right. has a beginning. Except the Lord God Almighty. He is eternal. And then the other distinction is, worthy are you, O Lord, to receive glory and power, for you created all things. And by your will they existed and were created. He's the creator. So he's the eternal, the almighty, and the eternal uh, whereas we are temporal, we are created beings, and he is the creator. And we are those created, and we exist at his pleasure, and we're dependent upon him, but he is um, completely independent. So he's of another class and category completely. Thus, he is holy, holy, holy. And in that sense, when we talk about ourselves being holy, um, we mean it in a small h kind of way where we are belonging to him and therefore we are of a different sort than the rest of the world as well. All right, so, so then we just kind of just to finish the scene here. So the four living creatures with six wings and full of eyes, they're sent crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And then when they, every time they say this, when they're saying this, what happens next? They're giving him glory, honor, and thanks. What happens after that? As we close out the chapter. Casting the crowns. Yeah. And that's the, continuous. The 24 elders Those fall down. down. Yeah. So the 24 elders fall down before him who is three on the throne and worship him who lives forever. And they cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, our Lord and God. And casting crowns. Um, acknowledging his authority now he's the one who's placed him on these thrones um and in the days of of the ancient empires this is would have been understood you know the roman empire 
was a conquest of all these other nations. And each of those nations had kings. So they have all these kings, but there's one emperor over them all. So Caesar, who was Lord. And the kings would sort of take down in the presence of their emperor, their Lord would put, you know, bow before him and take off their crowns before him, acknowledging he's the one who put them on those thrones. You know, uh, King Herod was given that throne by, by Caesar, Julius Caesar himself was the one who put him in that place. And he's king by virtue of him. Uh, here we, we are the kingdom of, we are those who are kings and priests, but we have been given those crowns by the Lord God Almighty. And so in his presence, we acknowledge that before him. He's the one who put us in this place. That's why they put the crown on Christ, because it was for Caesar, right? Basically. Yeah, the Lord God Almighty, will he will crown him above all. Um, yeah, and we're going to see that in the next chapter. So right now, we're just, we haven't yet seen... Um, the son of God just yet. This is the opening scene. It continues in chapter five. But let's, uh, let's see if we can remember uh, a little quiz here without looking at your notes. See how well you remember the scene here. We got a couple of minutes left here. So thanks. All right. So John, um, he looks and what does he see? What's the first thing that John sees in Revelation four? The open door to heaven. An open door to heaven. All right. And a voice says to him, come up. That sounds like a trumpet. And what does he see? Let's bring it back. Let's try to remember what he sees for. What does he see? Throne. The one he seated throne. on the throne. He's one seated on a throne. Okay. Excellent. Um, what are the, um, he says, and then around the throne, he mentions three stones, three that the appearance of three stones, precious stones. Mm -hmm. they Carnelian. Were? Carnelian. Jasper. Jasper. And, Jasper. Emerald. and emerald. Excellent. Which formed, um, he describes it as, um, what, what it, putting those together, he describes rainbow. it as a rainbow. rainbow. All right. Now, the first thing around the throne um, are elders. Describe the elders to me. White linen with crowns on thrones. Okay, white garments with golden crowns on their heads on thrones. Excellent. And again, how many were there? 24. 24. 24. Okay. All right. Then we have the rumbling thrones. And then he looks and he sees there's one more thing around the throne. Right the in seven front of the torches. Throne. Before the throne of the seven torches of fire, right? Which is, he tells us, is what a reference to. The spirit of, the spirit of God. Spirit of God, Spirit right? Of God. Spirit. By the way, you see the seven, the twelve in uh, Genesis 15. Um, Abraham, when he enters the covenant with uh, um, with the Lord, has this vision of a burning torch going through the pieces. If you remember that scene, where he cuts the pieces in half and he puts them apart, and there's a smoking pot and a burning torch that go through it, which is symbolic of God's presence there. That was in Genesis 15. And then around the throne, he sees a sea of, of glass, just like crystal. Uh, then he gets to those living creatures. Remind me of those living creatures. Tell me about them. There's a few details about them. How many were there? Four. Okay, four. And he just gives a few details. What are the details about those four living creatures? The, an, uh, the, uh, an eagle in flight, a lion an ox in the face of a man. Yes. Yeah, and eyes all around. Eyes all around, full of eyes in front and behind. And one more thing. The wings. Yes. How many wings? Six, Six apiece. Six wings. Excellent, right? And then they never stop saying what? Holy, 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 holy. Holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty, holy right? Who was and is and is to come. Now, whenever they give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated, what happens whenever they give him glory? So as they're giving him glory. They're throwing the crown. Yeah. Throwing into the, the crown. crown. Yes. The 24 elders cast their crowns yeah. for the throne and say, worthy are you, O Lord. Right. 
excellent. So in the context of, of Revelation, this is, you have to begin with the scene of the, the sovereign, of, of twofold part of it, the, the sovereignty and the holiness of God, his glory above all others on the throne, seated, ready to act and move, who brings everything to fear and the gl glorious creatures praise him. But also at the same time, um, you see the love of God welcoming John up, come up and see the 24 elders that he's brought into his presence, seated on the throne with the presence of the Holy Spirit, the rainbow, the sea of glass and crystal, and them giving him thanks and praise. It's not like Isaiah who says, woe to me, I am doomed. Uh, it is no worthier you, O Lord. You created all things and by your will they existed. And so this, this dual theme of God's absolute sovereignty and power and glory and his amazing love for us, his people, making us a kingdom of priests, that's going to be the ground of our faith. And so when John goes forward and begins to unfold all the troubles that are about to fall upon us and all the miseries of this world, that we're rooted in that scene, that first scene in Revelation 4, which will continue into the next chapter. Um, of his uh, power and love for us. That is the ground of all our hope. So that's Revelation chapter four. And uh, we'll break it here. Any? Uh... Did you address one time, you know, the, 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 uh, this, the, the beings have six wings in this book. They have six wings in Isaiah, but they have four wings in Ezekiel. Did you address that one time? Is that in, an insignificant difference? No, I, th I think Isaiah is, uh, Ezekiel is emphasizing the four number in that way. And I think the six is going to emphasize the holiness of God because it's the two that are used to fly and then two used to cover the feet and to cover the face. So yes. it's really emphasizing the, the glory and the holiness of God. Whereas I think Ezekiel is, keeps driving home the number four for us. That would be my initial guess on, on, on that. Um, so as they, and this is really important, you know, again, they're, they're not striving for literal accounts of this. It's symbolic. And so they, they choose symbols that will drive home themes for us. And you're going to see that in the gospel accounts too, when you read stories about Jesus and you wonder, why, does, why is Matthew's account of the story so different from John's account? Uh, because they're emphasizing different themes for <clears throat> us, and so you don't you don't get don't get caught up in whether they, you know, is there a contradiction here? They're really trying to drive home a specific theme, and um, <clears throat> that's going to be important for us. So that 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 would be my my guess as to what what Ezekiel is trying to do, and uh, I think it's clear that Isaiah and John really want us to to behold the. Um, the holiness of God. And really, you, you know, the six wings, it's really three sets of wings is what it right. is. You know, um, so it's, it's more of a threeness than a sixness, if you will. So anyway, and it goes along with the holy, 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 three, threefold. Mm. All right, I'm going to stop recording here.